experience and a kind of like an establishment of a fair value based on historical transactions, legal opinions, etc. But you are right, American GAAP and US GAAP does very much follow um, sort of like legalistic form and substance is a quite fundamentally different concept to actually try and get your head around in order to make sure that you're accounting for things properly. And it is something that we'll keep going back to over and over and over throughout this course. For example, the next um, sort of chapter we're going to be covering is on revenue. And revenue is one of the main areas that IFRS actually deals with the issue of substance. In terms of at what point is a sale a sale? At what point have you provided a service? And at what point can you therefore recognize revenue? And so even though it's not contractually driven, there are indicators that can help us identify at what point the substance of a transaction has arisen and at what point assets have been transferred and liabilities assumed. So it's not black and white, it's kind of a little bit dark grey and light grey. So it's not completely wishy-washy, it's not completely um, sort of pick a number, any number. There is an element of um, science is probably the wrong word to use, but there, there, there is an approach which you can adopt under IFRS which will actually give you um, sort of a definite answer. The difference being is it's not driven by paperwork or contractual side of things. Okay. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, well what I'd like to do now is um, sort of if possible, I mean obviously if there are any more questions on it um, sort of immediately after um, sort of the, the, the sessions today finish, I'll actually be online for two hours to answer any emails that you may have um, concerning. So, you know, by all means, send us a sort of a, a, an email. Um, the issue of substance is, is one that's quite difficult to explain in a sort of like a few lines of text on an email. Um, but like I say, we will be coming back to the issue of substance versus legal form kind of ongoing throughout this course. But hopefully the stuff we'll do on revenue recognition just now will actually um, sort of like make you feel a little bit more comfortable with it. But it is quite a big step. It's not something that people just pick up very, very easily. And it's one of the reasons why US GAAP is kind of lagging behind a little bit in terms of adopting IFRS. But just to finish on that note, bear in mind at the moment, um, a lot of people and a lot of commentators in America and, and, and in the ICAW, we're doing a lot of work with um, people from the States at the moment. And you know, the thing to remember here is they're now talking about when US GAAP moves over to IFRS rather than if US GAAP moves over to IFRS. There are no dates at the moment, no one said definitely, but they're now changing their language and they're starting to talk about when US GAAP converges with IFRS rather than if US GAAP converges with IFRS. The major stumbling block on that is this issue of substance over form, but hopefully we can clarify and, and, and bring the two things closer together um, so that people are a little bit clearer as to what goes on. Okay, right, well, let's move on then to uh, Chapter 5, if you would please, on revenue. Okay, so, uh, Chapter 5 on revenue. Excuse me, before, before we continue, can I request all participants to turn off the mobile phone? Please turn off your mobile phone. Thank you. Yeah, we are getting a little bit of feedback from um, so like mobile phones and, and Blackberries and, and, and the like. So if you could turn them off rather than just having them on silence, it would be, uh, would be very beneficial. Thank you. Okay, so revenue. Revenue is a standard that really does bring out this whole idea of substance over form. Okay. The fundamental principles of substance over form is, comes back to the idea of assets and liabilities. So if we're talking about assets and liabilities, how come I'm now suddenly switching over and talking about revenue? Well, revenue recognition is almost the byproduct of changes in assets. For example, if I sell some goods to somebody, I deliver those goods, they then owe me the money. Well, I recognize the revenue because of the fact that actually I have a receivable. Somebody owes me the money. So the resulting change in the asset creates something which I need to credit and that credit is therefore taken to revenue. So we have uh, in this case a standard IAS 18 and that gives us quite a lot of information on revenue. Now the first thing that I just want to draw your attention to on this standard and this would actually form kind of a little bit more of your uh, sort of background reading. There is some really really helpful information at the back of IAS 18. So in IAS 18 Okay, there is an appendix. Okay, 
The appendix to IS-18 includes round about 20 examples of revenue recognition. For those of you that are going on to do the assessment at the end of uh, sort of like these sessions, it is absolutely vital that you read and are familiar with those 20 examples. Most of the questions that come from revenue recognition, um, sort of with kind of practical examples, tend to come from the 20 or so examples that are in the appendix to IAS 18. So please make sure that you are actually reading um, sort of IAS 18 and making sure that you get hold of that appendix at the back. You can download it from um, so like the IASB website, um, or like I say, you've almost certainly got um, sort of copies of the standards available to you. So, um, sort of the appendix is not actually included specifically in the notes, um, but it would be very sensible for you to use that as a little bit of background reading. So, what is revenue? Well, revenue basically comes from three different sources. Okay. The three sources, the first one is the sale of goods. So I sell products to my customers, they pick them up from my retail store or I deliver them on the back of a lorry or however, but ultimately this is now dealing with how do I recognize that revenue from the sale of goods. The second one is the provision of services. Now, bear in mind, this does not include construction. So if I'm building a new office block for somebody, that would not be coming in IAS 18. That would actually be covered by IAS 11, which we'll see later on in the course. Okay, so IAS 11 deals with construction contracts. In a strange sense of, uh, sort of irony, it actually tells you to do exactly the same thing that IAS 18 tells you to do, um, but uh, sort of in a slightly different way and using slightly different terminology. But the accounting treatment is actually virtually the same. The third one is what we refer to as other, which is usually the return on assets. Now, I'm going to put that in quote marks because this is our take on it rather than the actual uh, information that's specifically within the standard. And the return on assets would basically be things like interest income on your bank balance. It would be dividends received from any shares that you might own. Okay? Um, it might be some royalty income from allowing somebody to use um, some of your products under license. Okay? So those are the three types of revenue. The first one is sale of goods. The second one is provision of services but not construction contracts. And the third one is other, which is the returns being generated uh, sort of from your um, sort of individual uh, sort of assets. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So if those are our three types of uh, sort of revenue, we now need to um, sort of understand uh, exactly how to measure them. Well, the main form of, re of uh, revenue measurement is at fair value. Okay. Now, fair value is very difficult sometimes to identify. Okay. So let me give you an example. Um, sort of, I got married a year ago, and um, a few years before that, when my then girlfriend sort of uh, sort of moved in with me, um, she obviously brought with her all of her own personal belongings, and I have quite an extensive selection of DVDs and videos. Okay. And obviously when she arrived, she had different DVDs and videos, um, things like Pretty Woman and Dirty Dancing and, and, and things that sort of like, you know, movies that, that, that girls like. So she turns up with her movies and says to me, I need a bit of shelf space. So I'm like, mm, okay then, well I'll sell some of my films. So I put my films on eBay, okay, um, a load of John Wayne films and cowboy films and war films and things like that. So I put all this information, put it all on eBay, and I was trying to sell every single one at £10 per item. Based in the UK, it's at £10. The problem is, you see, is whilst that would constitute a market price, because they're on the market at £10, it's not really a fair value, because 
anybody who knows anything at all about those particular genre of films in the UK knows that one of our main um, sort of video distributors was having various sales and they were selling each one at one third of the price that I've put it onto eBay. Well, if that's the case, that's not really a fair value. So what is a fair value? It's a market price, fine, but that's not enough. The way that we judge a fair value is you would look at an arm's length transaction between a knowledgeable buyer and a willing seller. Now in that situation with my videos, I wasn't really a willing seller. I actually didn't really want to sell my uh, collection of DVDs, so I've actually still got them. Um, with uh, the knowledgeable buyer, a knowledgeable buyer would have known that those DVDs were available elsewhere considerably cheaper, and so therefore there's no way they would buy them. So even though that is a market price, it's not a fair value. Okay? And under IS18, we would measure revenue um, sort of at uh, fair value. Okay? So how would we constitute a fair value? Well, that fair value could come from present value calculations. Okay? So if you think of a present value calculation, and I'll give you a, a, a very simple one. Let's say, for example, I sell some goods. Okay? And I sell those goods on credit and I give them one year to pay. So it could be that I've sold some furniture and there's a special discount or a special offer on at the store where it's interest-free credit for 12 months. Okay? And so therefore I know I'm going to have to pay, let's say, 1,000 currency units okay, in one year's time. Um, well, if I've got to pay 1,000 currency units in one year's time, as we all know, that's not the same as 1,000 currency units today. So what I would need to do is I would need to discount the 1,000 to a present value. And I would use my cost of capital um, to do that. So if my cost of capital is, say, 10%, then I would take 1,000 divided by 1.1, which is going to give me 909. Okay? So I'm discounting the receipt of 1,000 currency units in one year's time. I'm discounting it back by one year. So therefore, my accounting would be debit receivables, 909, credit revenue, 909. Okay, so even though I've sold something and the ticket price on that piece of furniture is a thousand, okay, so like I say, the ticket price on the thing is one thousand, but because I've got a year before I have to pay it, the revenue that would be recognized by the company selling that particular product would actually only be the 909. Okay. So they would recognize revenue of 909. The question then remains of what happens next? Well, in a year's time, they're actually going to receive 1,000. So we need a debit cash of 1,000. Okay. We then need a credit the receivable Well, the receivable is currently 909. So we can only credit the receivable with 909. So therefore, at the moment, my debits don't equal my credits, which, as we all know, is a very, very, very bad thing to happen. So we need to force balance it. And that balance of 91 would actually go to interest income. So we'd actually be showing interest income even though it could be that the whole advertising campaign was that this is 0% finance, it's interest-free credit. And yet, in this case, even though it's interest-free credit, the company doing the selling would still actually be recognising a level of interest income. <coughs> so, fundamentally, how we measure these things, and the way we measure it, is using fair value. Now, under certain circumstances, it may be that we need to start looking at um, splitting out different forms of revenue. For example, let's say 
that I went out and purchased a piece of computer equipment, okay? And it comes with a two-year warranty and service. So anything goes wrong with this computer within the two-year period, I can take it back and get another one, okay? Or alternatively, I can have it serviced um, sort of every couple of months. So if something goes wrong, I can phone a hotline, somebody will answer it, and they'll deal with my queries over the phone, okay? Well, if normally people buy computers, and normally you can buy service agreements, separately. So if I can buy my computer separately from the service agreement normally, what you would have to do is you'd say for the combined package I would actually have to split out the different sources of revenue. So if we said for example that the package cost me 2,000 currency units, okay, the computer element and again this would be based on fair value so this would be based on uh, what I could just buy the computer with elsewhere without the service contract um, sort of embedded within it that might be say 16 therefore the balancing figure of 400 must relate to the service agreement so what I would do is again I would recognize debit cash for the 2000 credit revenue oops, of 1600 and then I would recognize the service contract revenue over the life of the service so to start off with I would show it as deferred income And then I would recognize into the income statement or into profit or loss over the two years to which it relates. Okay. So this is the basic process of splitting. It's also called bundling and unbundling. Okay. Now that's one of the classic examples that is in the appendix to IAS 18 and we don't go into a lot of detail in, in the notes. So the question is you have to look at whether you need to bundle or unbundle these different products together. And the definitive rule is always what normally happens. So in this case here, this business is offering a separate deal which is the computer and the two year warranty together. Okay. So that is not the standard sort of deal that you would get. The computer with the warranty may be standard, but the fact that they are including, almost as a freebie, yeah, they're including the service. What we say is actually those service contracts aren't so thing, aren't free. As we all know the phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there's no such thing as free servicing. If you buy a car, and when you buy that car, it comes with free servicing, again, the revenue would need to be recognized by separating out the service component from the actual sale of the car and the, each of those forms of revenue would be recognized um, separately. So what we move on to now is the actual recognition rules on the revenue. And as we said, there are three ways that revenue is recognized. Revenue from sale of goods, from provision of services and other. Okay. Now the two main ones there is actually the sale of goods and the provision of services. So if you could just take a look in your notes please on page uh, 63 down at the bottom, section 5, talks about recognition of the sale of goods. So at the bottom of page 5 there, recognition of the sale of goods, it gives you the five criteria. Okay. Now Highlighter pens or pens at the ready, you need to highlight up those five points because they are vital to understanding exactly what goes on. We're going to work through each one in turn, but it's very important that you can refer back to those five points because um, understanding and knowing those five uh, sort of recognition rules are very, very key to success. So the first one, 
Significant risks and rewards of ownership have been transferred from the seller to the buyer. In a simple scenario, this will burn the legal title or actual possession of the goods uh, passes between the two parties. The retention of insignificant risks and rewards are not necessarily prevented. So, transfer of risk and reward. Now, at the end of the last um, section on um, sort of accounting policies, we had a bit of a discussion about substance over form. And here we have it. In that first line, the significant risk and rewards of ownership have been transferred. Yes? We, um, at any moment, um, like I said before, our Vice President will step in and then we would like to hear from him about uh, his support for this program. Okay, would you like me to stop now and allow that? It's a suitable stopping place if, if, if the Vice President is there. Yes, he I'm is asking here. Um, it's, it's, Je it's Jennifer speaking from Vietnam. So um, if you could stop right now, it would be great. Okay, that's no problem at all. I'll, uh, I'll mute myself and look forward to hearing what the Vice President has to say. Gavin, you please sit and take a rest uh, because uh, we have already shortened some of the speeches before. So let uh, Jim Adam come in. Yeah, that's no problem at all. I'm more than happy to take a rest. <laughs> Just shout when you need. Finally, I just want to encourage, in a, in a session like this, I think all the interaction, both the teachers, but also with yourselves in terms of experiences you have, issues you have. I think Jim, please look at us uh, at the camera, please. <laughs> you can only look at the camera. <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend that. So I think it's particularly nice here that we have virtually the whole East Asia region online uh, with the six sites. Um, you know, the GDLN is something that
Tokyo's Tokyo office to give them capacity to do that. I hope the process Tokyo is to be useful. I always insist that there be an evaluation, so I encourage you to do that. So, um, I always expect to get good marks. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, I do want to welcome everyone to participate, and I do hope you find that by reaching out like this, and it's always a little harder doing it through six sites than doing it with one site personally. But the trade-off is a lot more of this. We can reach a lot more people. I hope one of the things you're able to do is exchange experience across the sites. Maybe you get a better sense of what some of the key issues are. So I wish you well. Care for teaching. Don't take on a rise too much. Any any specific questions? Two more minutes. Any questions from any of the people in the field? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, here in Thailand, there is no question. Any other center has any question for our Vice President, Jim Adams? I don't hear any question from anywhere. I don't mean to be that intimidating, but I do want to wish, how long does this go on for? Oh, this is oh, a continuous program. Not. This is one uh, for three months. Mm -hmm. This is one session. They have learning materials and they have tutorials. How often do you come back here? Seven sessions. Seven, Seven sessions. sessions together. Before Seven sessions. And then yeah. we continue to make a community of practice. Yes. How frequent do the seven sessions? Uh, once, once a month. Once a month. How many times do you do it? Yeah, I'm today. Well, I wish everyone good luck. Thank and you. if you don't learn anything, it's all his fault. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. London, we can now uh, start our instruction. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. That's uh, good to hear the, the, the support that comes through on um, for, for this scheme. And you know, I'd say to reiterate um, some of those words. I hope you're, you're you're finding it beneficial so far. Okay, right, back to where we were. We were on page 63 of your uh, sort of notes, section five, recognition of sale of goods. And like I said, these five criteria are absolutely vital to fully understanding what IS18 is really about. So the first one, <clears throat> the significant risk and rewards. Now, as I was saying, substance over form is one of those areas that clearly is a major issue for yourselves and for the rest of the world, to be honest. And this is really one of the first times we're getting a glimpse of what exactly do we mean by substance. Well, it all comes back to risks and rewards. For example, what do you think are the risks and rewards of inventory? <clears throat> okay, well, from my point of view, I would say that the risk of holding inventory is that you're stuck with it, okay, i.e. you can't sell it, so one of obsolescence. Uh, another risk might be, for example, that it takes a long time to sell, and during that time I've got to insure it, I've got to store it, I've got to make sure that it's clean and safe and doesn't degrade, etc. So therefore, I'm going to be responsible for making sure that that inventory is remaining saleable. <clears throat> well, if that's the risks and rewards of ownership, then surely if I take on those risks and rewards when I go into a shop and I buy something, then that indicates that it must therefore be my inventory. Now, for example, you've all heard, I assume, of sale and return. So I sell something to a customer, but if they don't manage to sell it on to one of their customers within, say, a month, they can bring it back for a full refund. Well. That, to me, doesn't sound like the risks of, uh, and rewards of ownership have actually been transferred. If they can bring it back sometime within the next month and get a full refund, 
then realistically it sounds like it's still my inventory because I haven't actually transferred risks and rewards. Okay? So, very important on the risks and rewards of ownership, you have to have actually transferred it in order to recognise revenue. Now, in most cases, for sale of goods, that's going to be relatively easy. You have a shop, for example, customer comes into the shop, they give you cash and they walk out with the goods. If they walk outside the door and drop it and it breaks, that's their problem, it's not yours. So therefore, clearly, it's their risks and rewards of ownership. If they're buying it with a view to selling it to somebody else, like for example a car, so the uh, manufacturer sells the car to a dealership, the dealer is then responsible for maintaining that car and trying to sell it to their customers, then the car would effectively be appearing in the inventory of um, sort of the, the dealership and not the manufacturer, irrespective of when legal title transfers. Okay? So if legal title transfers at the point where the dealership sells the car onto a third party, it's completely irrelevant. Now, I'm just going to go into that in a little bit more detail because it is actually quite a fundamental point. So I'll just write up that um, sort of example for you. So I have a manufacturer. Oops, sorry again, manufacturer. The manufacturer makes cars, and I have a dealer. Okay. So man is the manufacturer, deal is the dealer. Okay, and the terms of the arrangement are that legal title goes to dealer when deal sells the car to a customer. Oops, can't spell today, sells car to customer. Now, obviously, and that's the case, the legal title will go to deal and then immediately go on to the individual customer. However, when we look at the real terms behind the paperwork, we see that within this contract, that the price that deal pays to man is fixed. Okay, so the price that deal will pay man for this car is fixed, and it's fixed at the date the car is delivered. Okay, so the price that deal pays to man is fixed at the date that the car is delivered to deal. Okay, so that's the first clause. The second clause is that the car cannot be returned to man. So if deal can't sell the car to a customer, they are kind of stuck with it. Okay. Okay. And man charges interest on the value of inventory held by deal. So in other words, if deal has a car delivered to it on the 1st of January and it sells it on the 31st of January, they will only pay interest for one month on the value of that car. If they sell it at the end of February, then they will pay interest for two months on the value of that car. Now, we had the question earlier on about, you know, sort of con contracts and contractual terms. Even though these are contractual terms, they're contractual terms which indicate the substance of the transaction. So the only true legal term is this one, which deals with legal title. And it's saying that legal title goes to deal when deal sells the car on to a customer.